So, uh, good evening, good evening. Yeah. I think it has been a gap of about three years. Uh, so now, today, here we have gathered. Mm. Is the voice clear? Is uh, there some feedback? Some feedback, I think. Okay. Like this, I think. Yeah, this is better. Thank you. Thank you. So, for today's program, I was thinking we can try uh, to go with something like an outline of the commentary and by which I mean not to give like a full-fledged commentary, you know. To give this full-fledged commentary, then uh, on the side of the teacher, then I think uh, someone like me is, of course, not qualified, you know, to give a full-fledged commentary on Kanten Hagyama, why? Because uh, this special Guru Yoga, Gandhian Hagyama, it is simply not only about something like just inviting the Lama and then simply making some, you know, offerings supplications, etc. Not only like that, but this is very much connected with um, Anuttara Yoga Tantra practice, you know, highest Yoga Tantra, highest uh, Tantra. So, for a full-fledged commentary, uh, I only hope that, uh, that I aspire, you know, to have first the qualities of gaining uh, such some level of experience in this uh, practice, you know, not simply seeing, not simply knowing some word meanings or having had the opportunity to read some commentaries here and there, that is, of course, by, by no stretch of the imagination, that is not the criteria, you know, of uh, giving a full-fledged commentary on this um, precious um, Guru Yoga practice. But something like an overview, an introduction, if you will, this, I think, uh, we can do it like this. So, um, here, Guru Yoga, uh, it's very much connected with the two from the from the four tantra sets. It's it's connected generally. Uh, Guru Yoga is connected to the higher, two higher tantras, right? Uh, yoga Tantra and Anuttara Yoga Tantra. And this one is specifically related to Anuttara Yoga Tantra, highest yoga tantra. Generally, it is taught like this you know, from the viewpoint of the Anuttara Yoga Tantra practice.
But then there is also this tradition of practicing this guru uh, yoga from early point uh, from the viewpoint of sutra as well. Yeah, there's also this uh, tradition. So I think this is something somehow I feel more comfortable with, more, I think, somehow, I think, more beneficial, you know. Why? Because Sutra is the base of Tantra, or Tantra, Buddhist Tantra, you know. Sutra is the base of Buddhist Tantra, right? Without uh, the Sutra practice, then, then uh, there is no uh, Buddhist Tantra, right? Without the, without the Sutra base, then uh, no matter how many um, tantric practices one engages in, uh, then the essence is, is, is lacking, right? There is no uh, base there. There is no base. And without the base, then there is no, pos there is no possibility to be on the correct path. And without the base and the path, then there is, I mean, naturally there won't be the result. So, so such is the importance of our sutra practice. Before doing this Kandyan um, Hagema practice, then for the preliminary practices, of course, beginning with uh, taking refuge and then generating bodhis bodhicitta, right? The awakening mind, and then following that with the four immeasurables. You know, this is so important, right? So important. So first, taking refuge. We always recite in Tibetan Sangi Chodang, you know, that verse, Sangi Chosoma. We call it Sangi Chosoma. This is the verse. And um, we are taught from a very young age, you know, to, to learn this by heart. And for many of us uh, from the Tibetan community, especially from the monasteries, we know this from a very young age. And it is it is very common. So th this is why, and because it's very common, it's uh, many, if not, I mean, most Tibetans would know these verses by heart. Uh, so this is why our teachers, our gurus, uh, when it comes to uh, this taking refuge, this recitation, then uh, we are always reminded by the teachers that that refuge simply does not uh, it does not come from the tip of our tongues. You know, refuge does not come from the tip of our tongues, but it has to come from really one's heart. You know, it has to come from the from the depths of one mind. You know, taking refuge. So this is uh, of course easier said than done. So then. One must think about the reasoning, right? The premises of taking refuge, you know? Why refuge, right? And one good way of directing ourselves towards the refuge, the three objects of refuge, is uh, as His Holiness uh, frequently uh, stresses the importance of the four truths, the four noble truths, right? So it is by way of thinking about the four uh, noble truths that we take this refuge. This is, I think, a very good way because then we are simply not taking refuge out of just faith alone, but to 
take refuge with a sense of understanding, you know, with a sense of understanding. And as you all know, with the, with the great teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, with his uh, three turning, um, with the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma, uh, beginning with the first uh, sermon uh, on the four noble truths, beginning with the first truth, you know, beginning with the first truth. And this is uh, very important. The Buddha did not directly talk about, spoke about enlightenment, you know, didn't talk about the path from the start, but began with the suffering, right? Beginning, uh, began with the truth of suffering. And why, why is this, this is really uh, a wonderful approach, right? Because the Buddhas, from the Buddha's point of view, uh, it is very important to start with what you have, to start with where you are, right? This is how I think we are supposed to practice the Dharma, to, to look at ourselves first. Self-reflection is so important, right? To look in words. And when you do that, then you can uh, find that, uh, that somehow with all the things we have, yet we feel something is lacking, right? We feel something is lacking. So then when you look in words, then it is, then it is uh, clear that this is the first truth. You know, we are subject to so many causes and conditions and impermanence, etc. right? And ultimately, we are in this state where we are under the influence of our uh, mental afflictions, you know, glacier and karma. You know? This mental affliction is, is one English term used, uh, but I also like this other ter term called mental delusions, you know, mental delusions. This is somehow something quite, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's pointed. It, it's, it has a point to it, right? It's almost like it pinches, it pinches oneself. It pinches me, right? When I use that term. So with my delusion and this delusion, uh, is, is, is with our, with our current way of thinking, when we are thinking under the influence of delusions, then we are not able to see the way things are, but we only see the things as we wish, as we wish them to be, right? So, so this is how, uh, we think, how we perceive. And from that, then, uh, uh, naturally, then we have these two extreme, these two extremes, you know, one that is uh, leaning too much towards the attachment part and then leaning too much towards what we call like strong resentment, right? So from ignorance, from this uh, um, erroneous view of reality, then, arise, then arises these two other mental factors, you know, which are the two extremes, right? So one is uh, leaning too much towards the attachment part, desire, and then one that is too resentful, right? More uh, anger-focused or strongly uh, under the influence of anger. So with these three, uh, the three mental poisons, and these three then... Um, motivate our actions, basically, right? So, karma arises out of pleasure, and now we are in this state where we are under the influence of karma and pleasure. And then, uh, going to the reason why that is the case, then it is clearly the karmas that we commit, and the clashes that motivates them is what got us into the first truth. So then uh, going with the origination, and then uh, is there a way out of that, right? And then because uh, if there is a, if it is erroneous in its thinking, then naturally there will be a way of 
looking the other way, right? There will be an antidote, right? So because there is an antidote, then it it is possible that one can uh, be free from this mental state, right? So then this will be, with this we come to the third uh, truth, and then uh, how to get there, then through the Eightfold Path, or in an, another categorization, the three trainings, right? The three tr trainings, uh, so beginning first with an, our ethical conduct, right? Ethical conduct, and then um, something like shamatha, right? Shamatha, and then uh, vipassana, right? So shamatha, that's uh, single-pointed concentration, and then vipassana, insight or wisdom. So with these three, and beginning with secular, uh, uh, with this ethical conduct, uh, then uh, why is this important? Because in uh, ethical conduct, then uh, in in our practice, you know, the Buddha taught about the ethical conduct, and the ethical conduct is really based on compassion. You know, this is the base of ethical conduct. It's all based on compassion, on generating love for others, on kindness, right? So on compassion. So this is really, and compassion is the antidote of anger, of resentment towards others. So, so as an antidote to anger, one of the three mental poisons, then, you know, we have uh, ethical conduct and then single-pointed concentration. With this, then one really has to uh, look inwards and then free oneself from becoming distracted. And distraction comes, namely, uh, it comes from, from having strong attachments, you know, from strong desires and so forth. So then, uh, so th this is like, like for overcoming um, attachment and then to overcome ignorance, then, then one has to develop insight, the, the right view, right? The view of shunyata, of emptiness. So like this. Um, with this, then if you think like this, and then to take refuge, you know, uh, in the Buddha who shows us this path, right? And then to the Dharma, which is the actual object of refuge, and then to the Sangha, which is something like the support system that helps us in achieving, uh, attaining Buddhahood, right? Or something like overcoming one's uh, mental delusions, right? So like this, taking refuge in this way. So if we think about uh, the Four Noble Truths and use ourselves as something like the meditation base, if we think about how we as individuals, how we ourselves are very much under the influence of uh, of, you know, pleasures, karmas, and how we are in this, if you think like this, then this uh, results in, in taking refuge, right? But if we apply the same logic, uh, but now instead of just focusing on ourselves, if we focus on others, use others as the meditation base, and then meditate on how uh, they are influenced by sufferings, etc., like this, and then thinking about, uh, you know, the samsaric sufferings, and then also thinking about karma and so forth, then this uh, naturally uh, leads to having uh, great compassion, right? Great compassion. So with this, then taking um, bodhicitta, right? Taking bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta, So, so then this is taking refuge and then uh, generating bodhicitta. And here also, uh, then there's one point which is called 
people so generating the awakening mind which uh, takes the result as the path so here to uh, meditate you know that in the space in front of oneself is uh, the great teacher the buddha and then from buddha a replica then um, then arises and then enters you know dissolves into oneself and one by which one turns into buddha and then with uh, your with all the rays the light rays that emit from your whole being which then spreads uh, to the whole uh, universe and then uh, dispels away uh, the suffering and the misery of all sentient beings and then uh, as a result uh, they all become enlightened yeah then this meditation is 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 that part right it's called uh generating the awakening mind uh taking result as the path so at this point then it would be good to also uh, do this visualization and then to strengthen our uh bodhicitta then um by by way of um you know by way of the four immeasurables right by way of the four immeasurables so beginning uh first um with i think equanimity yes uh, because uh the four immeasurables they are they are in different orders you know one one the one that is is frequently used at, i think with first with uh with love and then compassion and then joy and then equanimity right so this is usually like that but uh, here then uh, also i think in 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 most of the lamrim commentaries in most of the lamrim commentaries then the four immeasurable starts with uh, equanimity you know with equanimity right and then with uh, love compassion and uh, rejoicing but but then uh, in one of this kandem uh, hagema commentaries then it, uh, the order was somehow little modified and it, it began with uh, equanimity and then compassion then love and then uh, joy joyfulness right rejoicing at the end so this way i think then it's also appropriate so first why begin with equanimity because without equanimity then it would be very difficult to uh, uh to generate immeasurable love or compassion right because uh, without equanimity then our love i mean we all naturally we all have love and we all have uh compassion but somehow uh, they are little what's the word biased right they are biased and not very uh not all encompassing not all encompassing so they are we have some love and compassion for some but not for others right so this is why it's important to generate equanimity so to to equalize our minds right to equalize our minds from all of this on these two extremes right um from uh, resentment to a certain group of sentient beings and then uh, having maybe too strong ha having very strong attachment to a certain group of beings so to free ourselves from that then to bring equanimity in our mind stream in our practice so then to uh, meditate on equanimity and then gradually once uh, we find ourselves that our mind is now somewhat maybe not so biased we are not feeling the two extremes and that we have come to some something like like a most more composed mental state and then to generate um uh, compassion you know wishing all others uh to be free from sufferings and their causes and then moving on to uh, wishing everyone 
every beings to be happy and to have all the causes uh, for happiness and then uh, and then having the and then rejoicing yeah rejoicing in this in their happy state of no more something like an irreversible or uh, happy happy state right happiness uh, so like this so then um to uh, meditate on the four immeas immeasurables so then um for example when we were taking uh, taking refuge then uh, to something like um uh, putting it says yeah, surrounding you know to to imagine oneself to imagine yourself as being surrounded by all sentient beings and then taking uh, refuge all together you not know, all together not just oneself but with all uh, uh, sentient beings uh, surrounded then vi to visualize yourself as taking uh, refuge all together all together this i think uh, as we say something like that this is also auspicious, you know, this is somehow auspicious. Thinking like this is somehow auspicious. And it also, I think, it helps, you know, later, uh, like in the case for generating bodhicitta or, uh, or generating immeasurable equanimity, right? Then it also helps, I think, with, uh, with perhaps not really distancing not having this big distance with others because if if you are able to visualize uh, that you are surrounded by all sentient beings and here when when we say all sentient beings uh, it might seem i think somewhat abstract you know when we say all sentient beings like how, how does that look, you know? How does all sentient beings look? You know, so when we read, when we come across these commentaries, then it is important that uh, to really uh, try to apply it to ourselves, right? So when we say all sentient beings, then okay, to visualize each and every sentient beings of the universe, I think this is almost impossible to to visualize right but now when it says all sentient beings maybe we can do it like this how about can i try to visualize all sentient beings that i know yeah this is a start all sentient beings that i know i will try to visualize each and all of the beings that i know right and then visualize that with all of them together, then taking a refuge with all the beings that you know. Uh, so taking refuge all together like this. Otherwise, then uh, there, there, is, there is a risk that somehow these words may become somewhat uh, like dry. You know, you just say it. It, th these are very nice words, but without having any kind of like feelings, right? Without having any feelings, so so then so then to ask yourself this question: How do? Oh, what should I do here? You know, what? Uh, uh, where do I find the the part mm, lacking? You know. Um, you know what I mean, right? If 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 it is starting to become kind of uh, like dry and rudimentary, then you have to perhaps it's a good thing to also sometimes change something. You know, change something. The point is that it has to sort of uh, it has to that you have to be touched, right? You have to be touched. Your mind has to be in it right and 
Uh, this is, I think, yeah, very important. We will come across many different points where, uh, you know, people have these questions. And many of these questions, I think, arise along those lines. Because now, these are very nice words. But who said these words? This, I didn't make up these words, right? I didn't make up these words. So I'm, am I simply just repeating just someone else's words? It's very nice words, right? It sounds very nice, but it's like, okay, I should try to, um, I should wish for enlightenment for the sake of all others, or, and, I, I am visualizing all sentient beings taking refuge together with me. Okay, but, but then it has, to, it has to start with the faith, you know. When you say sentient beings, it shouldn't be an abstract thing. If you keep it abstract, then I, then I, I think uh, developing immeasurable equanimity would be quite difficult, right? Because um, this is why, uh, like in the Lamrim, it mentions very clearly, you know, enemy, right? Or families and friends. So, so this is why it's, 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 it's important to put a picture, to put a picture, and then try to work on that, you know? Try to work on that. Because, um, you know, uh, Two nights back, when we were watching uh, this video of of Taya Rinpoche, of Taya Jango Rinpoche, Rinpoche at one point said, now, after 20 years, now, to ask oneself how much one has changed, right? So, so this is so true. This is so true. And I think some part of this, for these changes to take place, it is important that we do not, uh, that it's important that we sometimes have to step out of the, these abstract things and then really put a face, especially when, 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 we are, when we are meditating on the method aspect, when we are uh, meditating on the four immeasurables, when we are meditating on uh, on 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 bodhicitta, when we are meditating on great compassion, when we are meditating on tonglen, right? Very important to put a face to begin with. Faces, you know, to begin with people we know, to begin with people with we know, and then uh, people we know who we really have much love for, and then the other group of people who we are sort of distancing away and have some feelings of resentment. This is very important, you know, to never uh, uh, to neglect our enemies, right? The so-called enemies, the so-called enemies. This is very important because if you are, uh, if, if I am not thinking of my so-called enemies, then, then how can I bring equanimity, right? How can I bring equanimity? And if I'm not able, uh, if I try to simply turn away from them, turn a blind eye on them in, the, in this context of generating equanimity for all beings, uh, then uh, this, is, this is not healthy, right? It is not good. Then I'm not able to overcome to overcome this distance right then i'm 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 never able to uh, overcome this di distance this resentment right so really to generate i think uh, this compassion right especially in the in the mayana tradition you know this is you know always to remember that this uh, tantric Buddhist Tantra is part of the Mayana tradition.
you know, to never forget that. And the Mayana tradition, this, the essence of the Mayana uh, tradition is, is just these two, the method aspect and the wisdom aspect, right? The two bodhicittas, conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. These two are the, they are really our practice, you know. You cannot go beyond that. All, all of these uh, so-called tantric practices, they are all different versions of these two awakening minds. To always keep this, I think, uh, to always uh, remind oneself of this fact, this is very important. Otherwise, it's, you know, especially uh, for you now, when you are like approaching Tibetan Buddhism, of course, Tibetan Buddhism is, is so colorful and there are so many things and it's like, it's like so many distractions, right? So many distractions. But, but really, I mean, what is the point of all these images, you know? All these images to understand the meaning behind those. This is so important, right? And each of these images is symbolizing, right? Is symbolizing one path or another path that is specifically connected to either of these two practices. Uh, these two uh, bodhicittas, these two awakening minds, right? So, for example, like when we have an, an image of Chenrezig, then Chenrezig is the personification of the Buddha's compassion, right? Or when we have Green Tara, then is the uh, symbolizing the Buddha's uh, enlightened activities, right? So like this, even something like like a more wrathful or you know something like in a in a union, each of those. There is a symbolism behind that. There is a meaning behind that. And it is uh, something like, for example, one, uh, for example, Yamantaka. You know? Many of us are familiar with the name Yamantaka and also somewhat familiar with the image of Yamantaka, but maybe not so familiar with how many implements, what are the implements in each hand, maybe not so familiar, but still we know we have a general uh, uh, picture, general concept of how Yamandala looks, right? From looking at the image, but is, is that Yamandala, right? Is, is that Yamandala, how it is portrayed or how it is uh, drawn by the Tanka painter? You know, is that Yamantaka? Is that how Yamantaka looks in real life? And, and does he really, does Yamantaka really have these two great horns? And then one time, I remember His Holiness, uh, you know, was, was, was giving one teaching. Uh, and then His Holiness said, if Yamantaka really had these big horns, then how, how would he sleep? You know, like like what he would need some very special pillows and also the beds, and this would be quite complicated if he really had such long horns. You know, so so then uh, it is not like that, right? This is something like conventional Yamantaka, but then there is the ultimate Yamantaka, right? The ultimate Yamantaka, and likewise, how we say the outer Yamantaka, the inner Yamantaka and then the secret Yamantaka. So those of you who are uh, familiar with this highest yoga tantric practice, then you already know something like what this iconograph, iconography signify. You know, they really signify the path, right? And this is, I think, very important. Otherwise, if we uh, do not know the background, right? And the, and the, and the, and the symbols and the, uh, what they mean and how, how there are different ways of looking at this, you know, these different layers of understanding and these different layers of reality, 
if we without having no um without having no concepts on about those and then this then this could open the doors for doors of misunderstanding you know misconceptions right so this is again something that just i felt that was important to just share um so like that now what else needs to be added is is everything okay everything was uh, was clear if you have some if you have questions please feel free to ask any time we don't need to designate our question time you can ask if you have some questions or maybe if maybe later then you can also ask questions If anyone has any question, you can just raise your hand and then I'll pass you the mic. So don't be shy, just be open. <laughs> oh, one more thing. And then I think one very important concept, uh, one very important part of, of uh, I think, our practice something like one of the very important backgrounds premise premises is of course rebirth rebirth now the concept of rebirth right so rebirth people have this question does rebirth really exist? And if it exists, how so? Can you at least explain it? You know, like something like present the argument for the case of rebirth, right? Well, um, in different Buddhist texts, of course, then there are different um, stories. For example, like the Jataka tales, you know, these are all stories of Buddha's past lives, you know, what, how the Buddha had engaged on the practices of the six perfections in different life stages, right, in different lives. So we have something like those. And then, um, what is this sutra? Timetapa. In which the Buddha uh, says that, you know, he comes from this deep meditation and then uh, says that I've, I can now remember this past life and that past life and so on and so forth. You know, he, he proclaims that, right? So there's also one such sutra. Can you recall the name of that? Hmm. Anyhow. So something like, what is mind, right? This question of rebirth, uh, the answer to that, I think it has to do with the question, what is mind? Where does mind, where does 
mind come from, right? Mind is defined as as uh, clear, right, and knowing. So clear is it's like entity, uh, and that knowing is. <clears throat> its activity mind is neither a physical object nor an abstract object right yet it is it's changing so it's not permanent either so we are clear on right so we are clear on some things that it is not a physical state it has no forms right it has no color it has no shape right it is not an abstract because you can feel it because you are thinking within it and that thinking is, is it's not separate from mind itself. It's very much part of consciousness. So it's not an abstract, an abstract phenomena. It's, it is not. And because it's ever changing, therefore neither is it a permanent phenomena. So we are canceling but we are cancelling some of those possibilities, right? Okay, that's one. So, for example, when we talk about causes and conditions, cause, when we have cause and conditions, then Again, there is a substantial cause and then there is an accompanying factor like the conditions, right? So the substantial, is that right? Substantial cause. The substantial cause for mind is explained to be a previous state of mind. Because if it is not a mind, Um, and I think also imprints are also substantial cause of mind or maybe they are conditions for consciousness then a sub substantial cause has needs to have the same substance so it has to be a, a consciousness it has to be consciousness, right? If it is not consciousness, then it cannot become consciousness. So something like a substantial cause, causal factor is in the case of mm, a pot, the clay would be the substantial cause, right? So this clay and the pot, they are in different states. In, the, in its previous state, it was the clay. But then with some modifications to the shapes and then perhaps with, with uh, what do you call that, sotang. When you let it dry or by heating temperature, it becomes, it solidifies, then it, it is called a part, right? So something like that. So substantial cause. And then uh, like the hammer that was used or the tools that were used, uh, the fire, etc. are 
what is considered to be um, what is what is the other we have substantial cause and then what's the other one excuse me condition okay okay accompanying factor yes, yes the term is something like that yeah <clears throat> so causes and conditions So then from with this explanation, then mind is only it it rises from its own past continuum, right? It rises out of a past state. And we have uh, arguments such as if it doesn't arise out of a previous conscious state, uh, then uh, what are the other possibilities? You know? And if it arises from a form, then somehow it doesn't sound right. You know? If it rises out of a form, then one could say all forms are also consciousness. You know? oh, what are the distinctions there where a type of form can become consciousness, but another type of form cannot become consciousness. So there are different uh, logical explanations there. So to really understand rebirth, I think it's, it's very difficult, you know. Of course, there are some explanations some arguments for this case for rebirth but again this is somewhat limited yeah there are limits to uh, to logical explanations because we are dealing with something that is not abstract we are dealing with something with our minds but using logical explanations which are somehow which, which are somehow abstract in trying to establish something that's not abstract, then it's difficult. But I think with some of these explanations, they are somewhat helpful. They are somewhat helpful. So this is one thing. And then on the other side, the stories of people's e experience. This, I think, is very interesting. I've heard some professors have uh, compiled many case studies and published books like that, right? Of, of people actually... Uh, remembering their past lives, like uh, their, uh, the parents of their past lives, and then they were then meeting and so forth, they met and so forth, and then later uh, this child then had a set of two parents, two parents, right, and then was living with two parents. So this life parents and then the parents of the previous lives. So some stories like that. Uh, these are based on case studies, so very interesting. But then to a skeptic, I think even with these case studies, to the most uh, stubborn skeptic, I don't think even these case studies really would uh, bring much light, you know. They would still stand by with their skepticism because this could be attributed to false memories through social constructs like that, right?
So even though it seems like we say we can uh, use reasonings for this, it's funny because these reasonings and what we are trying to find, after all, they are not, they do not exist objectively, right? We have to remember that somehow. We have to remind ourselves as that, of that fact. And since they do not exist objectively, then what is the line between existence and non-existence, right? If we hold it as, hold something onto it as existing, it exists to our mind. If we do not hold it as, if we hold it as non-existing, in our minds it doesn't exist. And when you apply that onto not just one individual's mind, but into existence and non-existence, right? Not, not using a reference point, a particular person's mind or from the viewpoint of one person, but simply say existence and non-existence, then I think uh, it starts to become, the boundaries are somehow less clear. No, they are less clear. But then on the other hand, for me, it's, it's very clear with this rebirth. Even though uh, I can use some of those logical explanations, I cannot, it, I find that whether something makes sense or not, it has to do, half of it has to do with you. Half maybe with the reasoning or whatever, right? But half of it, it has to, it has to do with the receiver. So, this is uh, one point. Especially, I think, uh, when we are approaching uh, with, with people who have or, 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 or when we are going into a society where there is not this, where, where there isn't this concept of rebirth, you know, of past lives and future lives, then I think somehow uh, many people find this quite difficult, right? But in, in, a, society, in a society where this is accepted uh, widely, then we just go with it, right? We believe it. We don't have the proof for that, but we believe it and we base many things around that belief, right? Around that belief. I think uh, over the summer in Germany, we were having some discussions and discussions and I think many, uh, I think some of you were also watching the whole discussion online, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so you saw, so you saw. So very interesting, very interesting. But then, this matters, it's, uh, it's something like, the way I see it, then, yes, do I experience, do I have a direct realization that past lives and future lives exist? Of course not. Fortunately, I've been exposed to some logics. Are they helpful? Yes, very much. But for me, like most of you, it comes mostly out of faith. 
It's so natural, right? It's so natural. Now, the more important thing is what do we do with this concept? This is the important question, right? Okay, now that I believe in this rebirth, then how do I bring that, you know, into my practice? Because practice, practicing the Dharma, as Rinpoche mentioned uh, in the video, I think Rinpoche mentioned in the video that it's really about becoming a good human being, right? Or a better human being, right? So, how do I use the concept of rebirth in relation to that? Yeah? If you find that not believing in rebirth is actually better, that, that, that works for you at least in becoming a better human being, then I think if you think that believing in rebirth inhibits you as a practitioner, but without believing in rebirth, you find that more relatable and that you feel that you can bring this into the Dharma practice and that would also, it, it, it will work better with becoming a better human being, then I think that's, that's, that's good, you know then one can do that. On the other hand, if you believe that this concept of rebirth, that you can use this and somehow uh, no, uh, that you feel that it is useful in, 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 in your practice, right? In becoming a better person, in maximizing your good qualities, then I think that's all. That's also very good. You know, that's also very good. So it's, these uh, issues are not easy. You know, to accept, to analyze with an unbiased mind. For me, I've, I, I, I found this very interesting, you know, how to not be biased in analyzing, right? How to not be biased in analysis, in, 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 in investigation. Our teachers really say it's very important. They emphasize the importance, you know, not having a biased mind. But we are already biased, aren't we? <laughs> we are already, and especially as, as Buddhists, then how can we, uh, uh, like no matter how much I try to think about rebirth, I'm always leaning on the side of rebirth, right? I know that's where I'm going to end up, right? So, this unbiased mind, very interesting, very interesting. Perhaps we, we may have to define it. Depending on how we define the unbiased and biased, I think if we are not careful, if we become maybe too liberal in explaining this biased versus non-biased mind, then pretty soon, uh, it might really be hard to be biased, right? But on the other hand, if we make it, if we make it so, if we define it so, so that we can yet still find some bi some unbiased states within ourselves, then I feel like we are we are trying to cheat. You know, I feel like we are trying to go easy on us, on ourselves, right? So. Just one point, yeah, one point.
sometimes I think it is uh, important uh, in examining, you know, this is, I think, self-reflection, you know, self-reflection, especially in the context of practicing the Dharma, where there is so much, um, what is the word, emphasis, you know, on motivation, right? Yeah, the two, the two activities uh, at the end, right? One at the beginning and one at the end. So in the beginning, the motivation, and at the end, uh, the dedication, right? Is it dedication or aspiration? I think dedication, yeah. So these two, who are not simple things. It's not simply like I'm just reciting some nice words, no? Because if I simply just recite, of course, there is a good thing. There is a benefit in even reciting any aspiration, aspirational prayers, any aspirational prayers, any sutra verses. No doubt there are benefits. There will be benefits, right? There's no doubt in that. Because simply, even uh, by saying these words, somehow our mind is drawn by these words, right? Somehow we are we have to say it, right? So we are, in that point, we are forced to think about the meaning of those verses. So that's very important. So the mere act of just uh, reciting, you know, these aspirational prayers, this is really wonderful. It's very good. But then, uh, at the same time, then, to, to, to say it as if it is really coming from your own side now, that not only does that has, the, has all the benefits that comes with just merely reciting, it would not only have the benefits of just the mere, the mere recitation, but on top of that, it's so, it's, there is no need to explain the further benefits, you know, if 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 you say it as if it if it was coming from your own side, you know. Yeah. So uh, this is very important, right? To when we say something, some verses. Do I really mean that? You know, to just remind, to ask this question. Do I really mean that? And if I find out that I don't mean it, then I should take some time off, not say it, but reflect on the meaning of the verses, you know, and then Look at what's happening during that moment. So if I find out that I'm not saying it out of my heart now, then why is that? Why is that? Is it because I'm too or distracted, too distracted by something? Or is it because I have to be somewhere? I'm late. Yeah. If I'm late, then, then next time I, sh I do this, I should do it when and then have more time, and not do it in such haste, right? And if I'm doing it because I'm too distracted, uh, you know, maybe it's the movie that I that that I am thinking about, or or I don't know, you know, there are many distractions, right? So then, then maybe before the whole motivation, what is a good thing to get the distractions? To calm those distractions, you know, to calm the mind. Of course, thinking about impermanence. Impermanence is, is very important, right? Impermanence is something like the wake up call for practicing Dharma. Without reflecting on impermanence, 
then our fascinations, you know, for the pleasures of this life, uh, is, 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 it will remain very strong. And so long as that remains strong, then I think um, a Dharma practice, even though we might have good faith, we might have good aspirations, but then it will always remain just, just on that level. You know, always aspiring for something, but not really engaging in Dharma, right? So, so then how to get down these distractions, all these fascinations, then thinking about impermanence, thinking about how, and impermanence is really about the changing nature, you know, that the fact that anything could change, the fact, and I think the last few years have been a, 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 like something like a, like a great reminder of that or something like a teaching, if you will, you know, so like this, to think like this, you know, and then when our mind is more calmer, then it's, it's a good thing to then begin with motivation. So this is why before our actual practice, to find good time. Timing is very important. So to always have good time so that you don't have to hurry with Kanten like Yama, you know. <laughs> so so that you have some time for all these preliminary practices, right? And then you also have like some like buffer zone, like some buffering time after the actual uh prayers, you know. So if you have some time like this, then even if you do only a few verses, then this will be really uh what is then there will be like high quality, you know. I think in Singapore this is very important, right? <laughs> yeah. You say quality check or on, on these products you have what is that quality check? Q QC. Yeah, QC. Oh, QC. Oh, quality control, sorry. Quality control. Yeah, so QC, this is important, right? It is important. Even if we practice only for a short time, if the quality is good, then you get the same results of, of uh, you, you get the same result as, you know, doing uh, many things, but not, but with many distractions, and then doing just a very concise practice, but doing everything correctly, doing everything uh, and doing everything, you know, with, with, with a sense of joy. Yeah, this is very important. We don't, it is not important to have lots and lots of practice, but whatever practice you have, then to do that with a sense of joy. This is very important, right? And then how do you do that? Then the Lamrim is so extensive, but you can pick many important points from there that is most suitable for you, right? So, so like this. And of course, you know, you have the Lamrim plus here uh, at the center here. So this is very good. Yes, and then maybe like like the postures, then just like the is it the seven the seven what is the word? Seven pointed? Not seven point of the Varachana, right? The seven Dharma? No. Lunam Nangi Chudine. The seven Dharma? No. Lunam Nangi Chudunde. What is the word? I think it's seven point. Posture. Seven point Baruchana posture. If seven fold, seven point, seven point, I think, yes. Anyhow, uh, you know, uh, if possible, this seven point uh, posture, but if, if, if the physical conditions doesn't allow that, no problem, you know. The point is, it, it has to be comfortable. Two important things. It has to be comfortable and res res respectful. 
So these are the two essence, you know. If it is not comfortable, then the actual session will not be very good. If it is comfortable, but if it is disrespectful, then I think that's not good. So respectful and comfortable uh, posture here. If uh, a seven point is, is, is not possible, then, you know, sometimes I think, you know, we might be like in a, you know, like in a, on the chair, right? Like that. So, so then, like this, and then with the, with the breaths, uh, then to visualize that when breathing in, uh, something like the good qualities increasing, breathing out, and then the negative qualities decreasing, you know, so you can visualize as, as explained in the different commentaries like this, whichever you find that is suitable for you, you know, suitable for you. This is important. There isn't one single right way. I don't think. Huh? There isn't one single right way that everyone has to adopt this way. Everyone has to do it like this. This approach, I don't think it exists. Yeah, and if it does exist, then it is, then the benefit will not be so much. You know, it will only benefit just a few, but not all sentient beings. So here, what is important is, again, how to bring it to your practice. You know, how to bring it all together, right? How to bring it all together into your daily practice. Maybe you have questions. Oh, do we need mic for that or not need it? I think we have questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there was one question. Yes. Um, Muche, I would like to ask, let's say we are like over the crowd, like in early in the morning when you go to the park, where you're walking towards the, you just feel that uh, it's a very beautiful day or that, then you just visualize everybody very happy and, you know, while you are walking leisurely at the park. Can you do visualization also? <laughs> Oh, and, yes. Like you visualize that, yes. you know? Of course, of course you can. Can. <laughs> yes. Because yes. especially in the morning, the energy is very good. Mm. And while you are walking in the garden, mm. you know, with all this fountain, bird chipping, all this, uh, then you, you visualize that um everybody is uh, very healthy and happy or whatever. You just... You just have did this visualization. Can we sure, do this for practice? Sure. Yes, yes. I think uh, generally speaking, whenever uh, we find some calmness, a calm, I mean, obviously, early in the morning in the park, I think is 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 quite calm, right? There is this calmness, and this is, I think. Uh, very important, and as as one is <clears throat> in this calm state, and then to visualize all others as also being in this very calmful state, if you can visualize that, then I think uh, this is perfectly okay. Yes, yes. Because for yeah. us working, I think um, we have limited time. So we will make full use of our time when we have, uh, whenever we have. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, 
coming for me to be this person. Uh, Rinpoche, uh, I have two questions. My first question is about um, uh, about the practice of uh, inducing suffering so that you can be touched by the suffering of uh, sentient beings uh, surrounding you. So trying to induce that suffering. And when you get that point of being induced, I think that, that, that suffering has already been induced. I mean, there's so much tears, you can't even go through um, the next line and the next line. And then... After that, so you finish all the preliminaries and you come to the actual text. And when you finish, you end with a dedication. But you feel so sad the whole day. Mm -hmm. How do I feel rejoice? The only time I feel rejoice is, oh, I finished my satan and then I rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Ah, yes. That's a very good point. You use it induce suffering, other suffering, meaning taking on their suffering, right? Did I understand it correctly? Uh, it induce suffering. No, I'm. Th it's thinking about their sufferings, right? So when you think about your suffering of all yes. the yes. sentient beings. Uh -huh. Especially when you go down to the hell level mm -hmm. and they're also sitting there burning, mm -hmm. you know, beside you. You can be quite painful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I meant by inducing. Mm -hmm. You know, to, 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 to bring that suffering mm -hmm. into you too, so that you can be touched by yes. Yes. that moment of practice. So, taking on the suffering of others. Right? This is a practice of taking. This is uh, very important. Taking on others' suffering or thinking about the suffering of others. Or this, I think, when we think of this, uh, on a daily practice, I think this is why it's important to first begin with equanimity and not go directly uh, to uh, taking on the suffering of the others or really thinking about others' suffering. Because if we think about the suffering of others, when we are not ready, then it could be counterproductive. Yeah? So this is, I think, very important. First of all, first, it's important to, I think, bring joy. Having Joy is very important. Different terms are used, like self-compassion, right? Okay, let's use that term, self-compassion. Self-compassion is so important in the context of generating compassion for others. It is the basis, right? That's why uh, beginning first with refuge, refuge starts with self-compassion. 
Without self-compassion, there's no need to take refuge. Right? Yeah, without self-compassion, there is no need for refuge. Just as without compassion for others, there's no need, there's no need for bodhicitta. Same, right? So, refuge and bodhicitta. Refuge first, bodhicitta second, right? Self-compassion first and then compassion for others. Very important. You are right. No matter what we do, when we think of uh, the suffering of others, it is somehow we also feel the suffering, right? And and here, one way to perhaps sort of bring something extra to our compassion meditation or practice is to think about how it is possible that uh, others can also be free of that suffering. You know, so whenever we generate compassion for others, whenever we engage in this practice of generating compassion for others, we always do it from the place of this possibility that ultimately they can be free of that. This is the basis, right? So this is why we say bringing emptiness and compassion together. If you can bring emptiness and compassion, compassion together, then with emptiness, it makes it possible that any being who has erroneous views can also be free of that view. Without emptiness, none of those erroneous views can be, can one, uh, can one uh, be free from, right? No one can, without emptiness, then this ignorance will, will be eternal then. You know, you cannot uh, get rid of ignorance, right? So, to bring emptiness and compassion together, then I think this compassion, as His Holiness puts it, then this com with this compassion, then there is a sense of confidence. You know, then you have a, you have, you are confident that, that it will not be in, not be in vain for uh, generating compassion for others, because there is a purpose. That it is very much uh, possible that, uh, you know, that those sentient beings who are currently suffering, that that state can also change, right? So I think like this. I don't know if this would help 100%, but I hope that it will somehow, uh, somehow it will take away some of these strong feelings. Thank you. Thank you. Rising part. The rejoicing part? Oh. I mentioned that only if we, I've rejoiced like only when I finish my sadhana. So, um, I mean, like how do I, I mean, so... The rejoicing part? Mm. It, is this part of the four immeasurables? No, no. No, I was saying that uh -huh. after my sadhana, uh -huh. I rejoice that, you know, I, I want to feel happy mm -hmm. right, that I have... Want, like yeah, I want to feel like happy from the inside and touched. Uh -huh. like, what kind of how do I generate that feeling? That, that joyfulness. Okay. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I I shouldn't be rejoicing it's like you know. Oh, I finished my sadhana and I never have to be happy, right? Right, right. Yeah. So I think, um, I think yeah, with emptiness, you know, you can, you can try, uh 
combining emptiness, yeah, or 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 using that something like as the backdrop for your uh, compassion practice to using com to using you know if 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 I use emptiness as as the backdrop for my compassion practice, then I see that there is a possibility. And if it is possible, then of course, seeing the possibility, if I have compassion for others, and if I see the possibility that they can one day be free from that suffering state, how can I not feel joy, right? So perhaps if, 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 if I do it like this, it will help me, right? So I think this is one way that I can try to uh, integrate, you know. But what, what I meant before, what I meant was to first have joy. And this joy, is, it's, it's, not, it's uh, not in relation with compassion for others, but just with self-compassion, right? With self-compassion and thinking about, for example, that the fact that right now I I have I have I have this human rebirth or human existence, as somehow sometimes the term is used. That I have I'm in this human existence, right? I have uh, this natural capacity to not only. Uh, wish to be happy, but also have this power to empathize with others, which if, if I was born as an, as an animal, okay, I can maybe empathize with, with my children or something like that. But on a bigger, on a more wider or on a more inclusive basis, as a non-human animal, I'm somewhat limited, right? But that is not the case. That is not my case, you know? that with this human mind, at least I can use the human wisdom, right? I can use this, use it towards empathizing with others and then uh, generating uh, compassion for others. So I am somehow endowed with these natural qualities. And just, I feel so fortunate, right? And that brings, I think, a certain joy. And this joy, I think you can also use that. Now, if you begin with this joy, so this would then be on uh, from the three parts, it would be the middling part, or, or maybe the first part, you know, the part that's in common with the person of small capacity, right? Something like that. So, so we begin from there, right? So, so, so again, the part, the parts that are in common with the person of small capacity, smaller capacity, again, to not uh, overlook those parts. You know, so to really integrate all of these parts from all three parts, right? The parts that accord with the person of smaller and then middling and then great capacity. So if to somehow to, to bring all these different elements together, you know, like it's a synthesis, you know. If you bring them all together, then each time you face some issue, then the other point helps overcome that, that challenge or whatever is, is, is bothering us, right? So to bring from, from all those uh, in short, from the Lamrim, you know, bringing all those relevant parts, re relevant points from the Lamrim, this is uh, so essential and so helpful, and yeah, so helpful in our in our foundation practice, you know, in our foundation practice, and and then like this, I think. But I think I feel there are some more questions. So, okay.
Thank you.呃，我想请问一个问题，就是您说当我们就是投胎转世的时候，是想成为更好的人。那么，请问就是当这个呃我们的那个心识分解的时候，我们要以呃怎怎么样的一个途径把现世的心识衔接到下一世去，成为更好
an enlightened being explains us all of this, still the limitation is not from the Buddha's minds, of course not. We are still limited. So it's very, uh, the subtlety of, of karma is really, it's beyond uh, the limited mind, really. It's, it's, it's beyond my mind. So that's just one thing. It has, did any of that have to do with the question? I don't know. All the things that I've said, did it go with the question? You're being too polite. Yeah. So, if I had not misunderstood, I think the question was something like that, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's saying that she, uh, Rishi, what Rishi just said only answered uh, part of the question. And uh -huh. What she was trying to uh, further ask was that how can we connect this life to, to the next life such in a way such that we, after having taken rebirth in the next life, we can remember um, Things about this time. How can we take rebirth in such a way that we can remember the things of this life? Oh, this I don't know. This I don't know. Really, to be honest, I don't know. This this is a this is a very difficult this is a difficult one. This is a difficult question, huh? Difficult question. Right now, let alone past lives, I cannot even remember two days back. <laughs> you know? I can only remember some moments, but what did I do at at 9, 9, 9 a.m. Uh, two days back, you know, on the third. What did, what did I do on the, uh, what did I have for, for breakfast? Or, yeah, the umbrellas, definitely. I, I can't forget the umbrellas. Yes, yes. That one, that one, I can say with confidence. I can remember that. Yes. But then, what did I do on the morning of the third? This I cannot recall, you know. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Oh yeah, we had sock, that's right, that sock. So you see, just even two days is, is such a big challenge for me, you know? So, so this, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about any practice that would help in uh, oneself remember past life in the next life, right? I'm, I've, I've never sort of come across any text that explicitly says it like that. But on that note, I think uh, if I, because I'm at liberty, I can freely say some things, I think I will say it like this. If there's any practice that would help us remember our past lives, then it has to be the practice of mindfulness. You know, if you practice mindfulness, if I practice mindfulness every day, I don't mean just like every now and then, but make it really central to my practice. You know, I think like in, uh, in many Buddhist traditions, the practice of mindfulness, they really emphasize this. There's really a very strong emphasis on, on mindfulness-based meditation, you know? Like, for example, when I'm eating, then I have to be mindful of the fact that I'm eating. When I'm chewing, I am now being mindful of the fact that I'm chewing, right? 
So if I do this every day for all my practices, for all my activities, for one single day, and then apply it to all the other days, then I think this, if there is such a practice that would help me remember this life in my next life, I think such a practice would would be the one, you know. So mindfulness-based meditation, this, it has to be that. So like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Muji. There's another question from level two. Okay. Um, you can begin. Hello, Rinpoche. Yeah, I do meditation and chanting with my children every night. But um, every night when we try to do chanting and meditation, the children will end up squabbling, uh, fighting, chatting, or fall asleep. So how can I help them overcome these obstacles? Or maybe should I just uh, let them be then and when the time is right for them, maybe they will start to practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. I would say, uh, yeah, going with the latter option. Just let them be themselves. The very fact that they are, so when they are, when they are doing all these things you mentioned, uh, are they in the same room as you are? This is a question. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in my bedroom, they are sitting okay. in the bed with me. Oh, very good. This is very good. But then, then I think it, it, it would be okay for them to be, to let them, to let them be as they are. The very fact that they are in the same room and that they can hear you, I think that is very good. I think that is very skillful that you're doing this. Yeah, so I don't think I have anything more to add to that. So wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. So this is something like for the preliminary practice. Uh, so that's, that's I think, uh, for today. So then I'm wishing you, uh, everyone, a good night, sleep. <laughs>